What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with another pod. What's going on in pop culture right now? I've got a bunch of movies to talk about as well as some news. And uh, News-wise, Jonathan Majors has been officially dropped by Marvel. We'll no longer be playing Kang. I have to talk about what they're going to do next. Do they recast? Do they do something else? A lot to get into there. On the movie front, a lot of big movies to talk about. Timothy Chalamet's Wonka. The Iron Claw, starring Zac Efron. Yorgos Lanthimos' Poor Things, starring Emma Stone. George Clooney's The Boys in the Boat. Uh, so yeah, make sure you subscribe. YouTube.com slash NostalgiaPod. Linktree.com slash NostalgiaPod. See the links below. Of course, make sure you come back for my best music of the year, which is out now. And my top 10 TV shows, top 10 movies are coming soon. And yeah, let me know it's good. Let's get into it. What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here talking about what Marvel should do next following dropping Jonathan Majors as King the Conqueror. A lot to get into with this one. But if you didn't know, of course, Jonathan Majors has been found guilty of abuse and some but not all of the charges levied against him following a two plus week trial and quickly following those though the verdict uh marvel dropped majors officially he will no longer be in the mcu no, no longer be playing kang the conqueror in the many kang variants that we had seen him portray in loki on disney plus and of course ant-man and the wasp quantum mania earlier this year and you know, I'm not going to get into uh, the trial too much. That has been pretty uh, widely reported on. You can follow the whole progress of the trial and everything about it, honestly, elsewhere. I'm not going to get into that. Nonetheless, he has been officially dropped by Marvel, and there's a lot to get into with that because the MCU quite recently had been set up around Majors as Kang as the next big bad, the next uh, central antagonist to that Marvel structure, you know, post Endgame in the uh, interim until Kang really showed up, Marvel had been a bit listless in terms of a central conflict. And there was a lot of hope that Kang leading up into uh, Avengers of the Kang Dynasty and, of course, the introduction of Secret Wars famously on screen, that would really get us back in the swing of central MCU storytelling. Obviously, the MCU has had a difficult few years. I've talked about that at length as projects have come out and uh, reception to those various projects on film, on TV, have waxed and waned, to say the least. Check out those videos for that. I'm not going to get into those details per se, but Marvel has an issue, and they've, they've known they've had an issue for some time. There was some really good reporting at a variety earlier in the summer about Marvel thinking about what they were going to do, and of course, you know, knowing a major's trial was coming up, and probably already leaning that they just didn't feel like they could move forward with him. Nonetheless, they waited until the verdict was official, not too dissimilar from how Warner Brothers waited until the Johnny Depp verdict came out in the UK before officially dropping him as Grindelwald in the Fantastic Beast series. Pretty similar, and in that Variety reporting, Marvel uh, apparently had been pondering not recasting Kang at all, but actually moving the storytelling in a completely different direction, perhaps moving towards the introduction of Doctor Doom, of course, famously, one of the big MCU bads at large, but also, of course, assuming would be our introduction to the Fantastic Four in the MCU, which we've, of course, been patiently awaiting for alongside the X-Men ever since uh, Disney and Marvel acquired the film rights to from Fox. So that's an interesting proposition, you know, I know we're going to get Doom, and I'm actually kind of more on the boat of let's not rush into that. Why not salvage Kang, you know? Um, I think the counter to that, of course, is that the movies haven't been that great. Obviously, Ant-Man 3, huge letdown. Um, moving on from Kang probably wouldn't make a huge impact to the general audience score because Marvel's kind of been in a rough spot right now, and Kang hasn't felt like Thanos to this point. I'm, I understand that point of view, uh, just because it's kind of easier to move on given where we've been at, this kind of Marvel malaise, this Marvel nadir. I understand that. That being said, it's still a good character to portray, and I think if you could just kind of refocus what you're doing in general and reestablish some kind of conflict with Kang, played by a new actor, I think that's pretty compelling. And then, you know, post-Secret Wars, I assume, will be introduced quite quickly into 
various other properties. Of course, we know the Fantastic Four movie is coming in 25. I believe it is now. The day has changed. And of course, we're already getting the seeds planted for an X-Men style drop from another universe. Of course, seeing Beast at the end of the Marvels really got that going in earnest. So I think you should recast Kang. And the question, of course, is who should play Kang the Conqueror moving forward? You know, there's a lot of choices, a lot of names, a lot of people to think about. And, you know, if you think about Jonathan Major's performance as Kang, obviously that will not be completely copied over. But uh, the manic energy Major's brought, I think, pretty effectively to the variant aspect of the Kang uh, character. All these multiple personalities, opportunities to do different kinds of things. In theory, it's an appealing role as far as franchise roles go because you actually get to do kind of a lot of acting you can ham stuff up at times you can do a lot of different things and demonstrate some range it's a far cry from like a really lame bland villain that you get in some franchise movies that's not what this is so who should be 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 the choice you know there's a lot of names out there you'll see uh, on social media trending right now john boyega damson idris aldous hodge uh, my pick would be Yahya Abdul Mateen. Of course, we'll see him again as Black Manta in Aquaman 2. Nonetheless, Yahya Abdul Mateen had been cast by the MCU in Wonder Man, a series being developed by Destin Daniel Cretton. And that has been suspiciously kind of buried. Uh, there's a lot of talk that it's been canceled, not officially confirmed at this time. Quite convenient. But Yahya Abdul Mateen excellent actor of course whether you saw him in Watchmen you saw him on Trial of the Chicago 7 film or TV wherever you've seen him amazing actor I'm a big fan of his and I think he'd be an excellent choice to slip right into Kang and of course the whole recasting of Kang I actually think could be very seamless for the MCU who of course have recast before of course Edward Norton to Mark Ruffalo for Bruce Banner slash the Hulk and most famously I think uh, from a, a baggage point of view would be Terrence Howard to Don Cheadle for uh, Colonel Rhodey Rhodes. The Kang character, though, is literally a, a, a character with various versions of itself. So if the versions moving forward just happen to look different because they're played by a new actor, that is probably the smallest leap in logic you can ever ask of a viewer of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I think that's very easy to pull off. Just got to pick the new character, uh, pick the right actor. And in general, the more important thing is for the MCU to get a shit together again from a storytelling point of view. Everything else will take care of itself. You're going to have a talented person in there. So I think that would be my choice, Yaya Abdul-Mateen, um, especially because he seemed uh, receptive to Marvel quite recently when he was cast as, as Wonder Man. Uh, also, like, underrated choice that I don't think is going to happen, but Daniel Kaluuya would be awesome as Kang. Just think about him in a movie like Widow's for example, the kind of menace, the way he can kind of lord around and stuff. I think he would be great. Of course, he's already been in the MCU as Wakabi in the first Black Panther. A small role, and due to scheduling conflicts, he was not able to return for Black Panther 2. Uh, he had been planning to, but then when they had to redo Black Panther 2 and then following the death of Chadwick Boseman, he was not able to rejoin the production. Does that leave an opening for Kaluuya to be Kang? Probably not. But that would be pretty sick. He He's arguably the best choice there out of all the names I mentioned. But I'm just kind of assuming he's not really a realistic choice. So Guy Abdul Mateen is my choice. And my choice is to recast Kang and give us Dr. Doom at a later date. You know, I think using Dr. Doom as kind of like a band-aid on the MCU right now, um, I, I don't think that's necessary. I think just get some get some stuff right. And we can get back on track. And I think Deadpool 3, which is the lone MCU film in 2024, I think it's pretty clear that that's going to do some multiversal X-Men referential type stuff for us in terms of who's going to be in that movie, what it's going to show us. And I think that will engender a lot of goodwill, assuming that movie does well. So I'm not too worried. But yeah, I'm in favor of recasting Kang. And yeah, I mean, if you think about Jonathan Majors, again, not getting into the trial itself, but just what a bag fumble, man. You know, coming into this year, rapturous reception to his film Magazine Dreams out of Sundance, a film that uh, he was expected to contend for Best Actor at the Oscars 
from with his performance. And then, of course, the big bad in Creed 3 and the big bad in Ant-Man 3. It was shaking, shaping up to be the year of Jonathan Majors, and he had already been kind of a hyped-up actor on the rise ever since last Black Man San Francisco in 2019. And, yeah, I mean, I think Magazine Dreams, which has been pulled off the calendar for some time by Searchlight when they acquired after they acquired the film, I don't even know if that movie's ever going to see the light of day, to be honest. You know, like, how, how is that going to get released? You know, maybe the, re- the rights can revert back to the filmmakers and the filmmakers put it out on VOD one day with no distribution. I suppose that's potentially in the cards. It's not going to happen anytime soon. And the other projects that Majors was attached to, there's a Spike Lee film, there's a Dennis Rodman film. I think we can kiss those goodbye as well. Will we see him again? Yeah, we'll probably see him again. He's not going to disappear, but it's going to be a while. And obviously the franchise stuff is long gone. So, yeah, I mean, back fumble by him. I was a big fan of his. He's a talented guy. But, um, I mean, he just can't really touch the dude after he's been uh, convicted uh, credibly in a court of law. But, yeah, let me know. What do you want to see the MCU do with Kang moving forward? Do you want them to dro- uh, drop Kang entirely and go to Doctor Doom instead? Let me know. And for more musings about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. What's up? Welcome to Nostalgia. Dave here with a review of The Boys in the Boat, the new historical sports drama film directed by George Clooney, starring Caleb Turner. This film, based on the book by the same name, is the story of the University of Washington rowing team that went on to compete at the 1936 Berlin Olympics, head-to-head against uh, the Nazis, pre-World War II, among other competitors. And this is a obviously historical story. You can look up what happened. You can probably assume how things go based off the kind of movie, based on how the trailer presents everything. Not really much to spoil here. Nonetheless, this is a movie that kind of feels right up George Clooney's alley as a director, and also the results of the movie itself also feel pretty in line with George Clooney as a director. Unfortunately, The Boys in the Boat is a pretty big dud, I have to say. It's broadly watchable. It's even a bit rousing and heartwarming at times, but it's really a movie that has, is so down the middle. It's so safe. It's also so staid, like sexless and emotionless, that it, it it's just pretty darn bland. And this is pretty solid material to do a historical sports uh, story about, but I was pretty underwhelmed by the whole prospect, I have to say. And George Clooney, to this point, as a director, he's directed many films at this point, back to the you know mid two thousand, and none of them have been that great. There's been some okay ones, like the Ides of March, I guess you could say, but uh, Suburbicon, I guess. But like he's not he's not a great director. I think we can pretty safely say that at this point. And the boys in the boat. I think the issue with this movie, it, like I said, it's just so bland. Like, there's basically no conflict to the story. Any brief moments of adversity are basically com- conveniently and completely resolved very quickly. Um, any side character or side plot or side relationship to the core plot of the rowers has no depth to it at all. And in general, there's not much depth to the movie. So. It's really just a adaptation of some history with nothing else tacked onto it, I guess you could say. You know, it stars Calum Turter as uh, Joe Rance, who, you know, that's the real life character. Uh, and Caleb Turner, you know, probably best known as Theseus on Fantastic Beasts. He'll be on Masters of the Air and Apple next month, which I'm looking forward to. But he's just given, like, really no material at all in this role, even though he's our lead. Like, for example, he has a kind of a romance at at school at the University of Washington with a, a woman played by Hadley Robinson. And apparently they uh, they they fall in love. Apparently they uh, hit it off. But there's no spice to that relationship at all in the movie. Like, they don't show you anything. They don't develop anything. And it's just so unbelievable. And honestly, a huge waste of Hallie Robinson, who I thought was really great as Jeannie Buss on HBO's Winning Time. She gets absolutely nothing to do in this movie. Um, and Caleb Turner, he just kind of just goes about it. You know, he has he has a presence to him. He has a uh, movie star look, for sure. Um, and he looks pretty jacked in the movie. But he has, like, nothing to do. That being said, he has more to do than all of his teammates in the boat. You know, this is the... 
if these eight guys can row as one, they can win. That's like our central message. But the other seven guys have no personality. We don't even know their names, almost all of them. Like, there's nothing to these dudes. And they're they're just like man candy, I guess you could say. Like, that's all they're doing there on the movie is, you know, wearing tank tops on, on the water. Um, it, it, it's just, There's just nothing there. And Joel Edgerton plays uh, their coach at the university. And it's like a solid performance from him. He has to uh, play a few different sides as he kind of weaves the politics of rowing, which was a very popular sport back in the 30s, and also try and coach up these guys, these this junior boat, which he realizes have so much talent that he has to prioritize them because they actually have a chance not only to make the Olympics out of the U.S., but actually have a chance to medal. And it's an okay performance from him. But like I said, there's just not like enough to this movie. You know, I have to say I was pretty disappointed by the uh, production quality with some of the stuff too. Like it's a period film; it's set in the 30s, and um, there's a lot of grounding in like the depression and like growing up in the depression. Joe is very poor. He's referred to as Hobo Joe at one point by someone pejoratively. His dad left him. Mother had died. Like all that's there. But on, on the other hand, like the stuff on the water. It's like so obvious that they filmed on the same like two or three locations for each location. So even when they go from training at the University of Washington to competing on the Hudson River in New York at Poughkeepsie, shout out Poughkeepsie, like it looks exactly the same every time. And I, I just it just felt a bit bland, you know? And again, kind of fitting the overall screenplay here, which is just so darn state. Um and then it it starts to get a bit hokey because you have this plot where one of the rowers gets sick um, when they get to Berlin, and there's like this doubt of if his ability to perform will affect the team and ruin their chances at a medal. And it turns out there's not only no impact in term- on his sickness meaning anything, but it's not even talked about or resolved in any way. It's just almost like basically ignored. He just kind of willed his way through his sickness. It's, it's pretty lame. Also, there's a moment where the, the boys... Uh, say what up to Jesse Owens before the opening ceremony, and it's like super. I I, I think it's pretty cringy to be honest, because it's like acknowledgement of like what Jesse Owens represented when he went to Berlin in the 30s and their 36, and yet this movie has no means to tackle any of that. So much so that the characters, when Jesse Owens is like, no, I don't want to show them, I want to show the boys back home, the boys in the boat, they just kind of like nod their heads and go, oh yeah, hmm. like it's literally all the movie can do. Um, Hitler's in the movie, of course, at, at the end there, and he's just kind of a character, sure, pretty, um, pretty, pretty amusing, I guess, watching him get pissed, watching his Germans lose to these guys, these uh, but yeah, I don't know, man, this this movie was 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 pretty dull, I have to say, like some of the some of the moments where like they win, they they uh, succeed throughout the movie, the, the set piece, I guess you could say. They like can get you get you feeling something just because I think the the music is pretty good at like manipulating the emotions of the viewer to like have you feel something. But at the end of the day, the movie is so dadcore and so just down the darn middle, man. I I, I thought it was pretty pretty bland. Just the lack of conflict, the lack of really anything like to this movie getting in the way, the forward momentum of all these guys. Like I don't know. In theory, could have been a lot better, but yeah, boys in the boat. Not very good. I imagine this movie's going to get trounced at the box office, opening at Christmas in a very busy holiday quarter. You have a lot of movies that open a little bit earlier that are going to stick around. I think this movie's going to get swallowed up whole, to be honest, and the the poor reviews are not going to help it. But yeah, that's The Boys in the Boat. If you've seen it, let me know. What did you think? Did you like it more than me? Uh, Are you with me that George Clooney is not much of a director? I'd much rather see him in Ticket to Paradise like we did last year, for example. Nonetheless, let me know what you're thinking. And for more movie reviews, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with a review of The Iron Claw, Sean Durkin's sports biopic film from A24, starring Zac Efron, Jeremy Allen White, Harris Dickinson, and Holt McElhaney. This is a Oscar contender. This is a Best Picture nominee contender. It's been a lot of hype for The Iron Claw as it comes out at the end of next week. And I have to say the Iron Claw is excellent. This is a very compelling, well-done film. This is also a heavy film. To use the wrestling parlance that you'll hear throughout the movie, a film about wrestlers, of course, this is a never-ending series of hits below the belt. This movie 
is devastating. It is heartbreaking. It is sad. It is heavy. Watching the fall of the Von Erich family as misfortune and tragedy continues to befell this family is very tough to watch. But ultimately, I think the movie is done uh, very well, and I liked it a lot. This is about the famous Von Erich family, a family of wrestlers. The movie takes place primarily in the uh, 80s and 90s, kind of picks up in the 70s. And, you know, we're centered with Hole McElhaney's character, Fritz Von Erich. Von Erich is, of course, the, the family wrestling ring names. They're actually the Adkinsons in real life. But uh, Fritz Von Erich, he, we're introduced to him as a wrestler who was successful, but never quite got his big break, never quite became the champion he wanted to. And as a result, who we are introduced to is one of the all-time bad movie dads. My God, will you loathe Holt McElhaney as Fritz? And it's a fantastic performance as Holt, from Holt. You know, of course... He's done a lot of good work lately. I think still my favorite stuff from him was in Mindhunter, you know, on Netflix uh, a while back now at this point. But man, Fritz von Erich as a character being this guy who's mad at the world and thus kind of manipulates his kids as he raises them into using that as, as their motivation in life. It's it, it, it's very deceptive what kind of guy he is, someone who pits his children against each other, openly talks about who his favorite son is in front of all of his sons, you know, um, very much the living vicariously through uh, your kids type uh, sports dad as well. Uh, it's tough, you know, and you watch it and we spend the majority of the movie with the with the children, of course, as adults, you know, uh, in in their 20s and so on. Uh, Zac Efron as uh, Kevin, Jeremy Allen White as Carrie, Harris Dickinson as David, and a uh, newcomer actor who I hadn't seen before, Stanley Simons as Mike. And, you know, Mike is the uh, kind of artsy soul, not really built physically, nor super interested in being a wrestler. You have kind of the golden boy son, Kevin, from Zac Efron. And then Jeremy Allen White's Carrie is actually initially outside of the wrestling family uh, fold because he's a prospective Olympian discus thrower and uh, he comes back to uh, the family and starts wrestling when the United States doesn't go to the Moscow Summer Olympics and I believe that was 84 whenever that was uh, early on in the movie and yeah I think um, it, it's so interesting spending so much time with this family because you have these brothers who clearly worship and idolize their father and seek his admiration, seek his approval, his love. But also you have this family that like really loves each other. These brothers really love each other. They call each other brother, right? You can see uh, how proud they are uh, of each other's success and, and well-being. And it, 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 it's challenging to watch them clearly just be under the spell of this manipulative dad they have. Nonetheless, the Von Erichs initially find success in the uh, WCCW uh, promotion. Of course, this is the time, you know, pre-WWF, pre-WWE, when wrestling was a lot of local promotions, very regionalized, but also very segmented, all kinds of promotions and tours kind of all out there. And this is kind of a fledgling operation trying to make it in the wrestling uh, business. And the Von Erich uh, children are basically Fritz's uh, path to getting that family belt that they so desperately see, uh, seek. And yeah, I think like the performances in the movie are, are, are almost universally tremendous. You have, um, I think Maura Tierney underrated as the mother of the Von Eric clan. You know, she doesn't have any like big lines per se, but I think the, the presence uh, she has, the grief she carries on her face, her inability to watch her kids wrestle on TV. Also the, clearly absent parent that she ended up being telling uh kevin to talk to her brothers about some adversity that comes up not really wanting to deal with it like it's a really good performance but this is i think the most hyped up thing about this is that it's the best performance of zach efron's career career uh, i think pretty obviously he's really great at wearing the heartbreak that never endingly seems to befall on him and you could tell as his, his fear of the Von Erich family curse as he begins to truly believe in it as uh, tragedy continues to befell all those around him. But 
despite the fact that Zac Efron has got himself so jacked, almost cartoonishly muscular for this role as Kevin Von Erich, uh, there's just, there's like a, just a lot of like heart and soul to this performance and to this character who is the through line of the movie. He is very much the main character, even though throughout the story of the Von Erichs at wrestling, who the uh, main protagonist is to the public definitely changes. You know, you have David Von Erich, Harris Dickinson's character, kind of uh, one up, skips ahead of Kevin because David is a lot more charismatic on the mic. He's really good at selling the fights. And, uh, you know, that's obviously a huge aspect of wrestling is being uh, able to communicate with the audience and have them invest in you in that way. And then, of course, the uh, tragedy continues. And eventually we really spend a lot of time with Carrie, Jeremy Allen White's character. And we're introduced very early on to what kind of character, a kind of person Carrie is, someone who kind of lives life fast and uh, does a lot, does the most, and you can think of many ways that can apply, both to uh, his presence in the ring, but also his presence outside of the ring, with perhaps the bottle, or other things like that. And, yeah, I think Jeremy Allen White, a lot of hype for him. This is honestly probably the biggest role, definitely the biggest role, most significant role with, from Eyeball's standpoint he's had since, of course, the gigantic breakthrough he's had on FX's The Bear, you know, Emmy uh award-winning uh, series and whatnot and i think alan white really imbues the physicality but also the kind of like tortured like demonized soul that you had in carrie and i think him and efron have really good chemistry um harris dickinson honestly it, it's um a smaller role you're kind of sad to see him leave the movie when he does because i just really enjoyed uh his dynamic with kevin as well and Harris Dickinson, I mean, the last year we've had him with Triangle of Sadness, A Murder at the End of the World, the FX miniseries, and now The Iron Claw. I mean, I believe he's only 27 years old. He is rapidly rising, you know, after, um, I think, a kind of steady come up to this point. Hats off to him. And, yeah, I mean, kind of spoilers from here. Um, and, of course, this is all pretty well documented. It's based on a real story, after all. Um, I think what's what's so damning about reading up on the Von Erich uh, tragedy in real life is that there actually was another brother in this story who uh, isn't even portrayed in the movie. Of course, the oldest of the of the Von Erich, the Atkinson boys, has dies of a freak accident at like five years old, and that's acknowledged in the movie. But there's another Von Erich who's not portrayed in the Iron Claw, and that is, I believe, Chris Von Erich, who also happened to kill himself um, in his early 20s. And like the fact that the Iron Claw basically had to streamline its narrative from a uh, plot perspective, but also almost like a believability in the audience perspective. And the fact that this is actually a story that was even heavier and darker and sadder in real life than it is in this already heavy and dark movie. Uh, kind of mind-blowing. Nonetheless, I mean, the spiral that you see Carrie go down, I think, is very uh, difficult because it, it, it's it's longer in the movie. You know, what happens to David, um, you... you kind of get set up for it and then it happens pretty quickly and next thing you know uh david's gone um of course dying from uh, apparently an intestine uh issue speculated to be a heart attack or who knows what it was over in japan and he's kind of gone but carries downward spiral after injuring himself in a motorcycle accident um having to have his one of his f uh, feet amputated and then realizing his wrestling career is uh, quickly ending, he's going to lose his contract. Like Watching that spiral, I think, is really challenging and really tough. But also, the biggest tragedy of all is probably what happens to uh, Mike, who never really wanted to be a wrestler in the first place. But once David's gone, sure enough, Fritz seems to have gotten his youngest uh, son in the mix, even though he never was really built or motivated for that. And what happens to him, I think, is incredibly tragic as well. Um, having a freak complication from a shoulder surgery leading to a coma, leading to some cognitive decline post-coma, and then leading to a suicide as well. Uh, it's really sad. And again, I think throughout the whole movie, you have Efron as kind of the shining light in the movie as someone who becomes disillusioned. But I think all these like key moments, key moments of tragedy, then eventually build up to kind of uh, satisfying development for the audience when he finally when Kevin finally addresses his father and calls him out for all his failures and what he's failed his family for, that's all earned. 
you know, even if you can kind of predict like core beats of the movie, I suppose you could say, everything feels so earned and feels so set up and um, you're just kind of with with it for the ride, even the fact, even though it's just so heavy and challenging um, to sit with. And yeah, I think um, it's it, it's a really good movie, you know, in terms of sad sports stories. I think it's really executed on well. And you don't even have to be a fan of wrestling or have any knowledge of the Von Erich story to really appreciate it. I'm certainly not a wrestling fan, but I think the movie does a good job of focusing in on the motivations of these characters and grounding that in their family and especially the influences of their abusive father. And you have a key moment between Kevin and his uh, soon-to-be wife, played by Lily James, who... uh, asks him basically like is wrestling fake and then you have kevin kind of giving i think a really compelling answer about the physicality and the setup and how you earn promotions and earn the belt like any other job that's a pretty compelling pitch for why even though wrestling is scripted why it's uh calling it fake is kind of uh short-sighted i guess you could say and i think that's a really important scene for any like nascent wrestling uh, aficionado who maybe doesn't quite understand wrestling it's a really good piece of writing to kind of indo- indoctrinate you real quick as you spend this time in a hardcore wrestling story um, I really like the scene where the brothers sneak out Mike to have him play a band gig at a local college um, if that was done pretty well uh, learning that uh, Kevin was in fact a virgin despite the fact that he's a successful and like locally famous wrestler I thought that was very amusing and Lily James to her credit I think it, it's definitely a thankless wife role but she does pretty good, I think, carrying some emotional beats as well. So it's not the best role by any means, but she does pretty well with it. And yeah, um, tough movie, heavy movie, but it, uh, it'll keep your attention. And it, I think it actually will feel satisfying for you in the end, even though it's a pretty unrelenting dose of tragedy once things pick up on that front. Nonetheless, shout out to Iron Claw. Um, I think a Best Picture nomination is, is on the way. You know, it's not going to contend for winning it, but I think it's very much deserving. And um, it's probably in my or close to my top 10 films of the year. It's been a great movie year, and Iron Claw is a big part of that. But let me know, how did you feel about the Iron Claw? What were your favorite aspects about it? Do you agree this is Zac Efron's best performance of his career? What did you think about it? And for more movie reviews, and also very soon my best movies of 2023 top 10, subscribe. And I'll see you next time. What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with a review of Poor Things, starring Emma Stone from Greek filmmaker Yorgos Lanthimos. This is Yorgos' first movie since The Favorite came out way back in 2018, which of course was a Oscar Darling, when it came out, Yorgos is, I think, one of the most esteemed and popular international filmmakers we have right now. And this film, Poor Things, which premiered back at the, during festival season and was delayed due to the strikes out of a September release coming out now at the end of December, very much still in the Oscar mix. Poor Things is the reunion of our, the favorite triumvirate, director Yorgos Lanthimos, screenwriter Tony McNamara and a star emma stone very exciting of course emma stone one of our great actresses of course already an oscar winner gonna be almost assumingly assuredly nominated for best actress once again she's tremendous in this movie and yeah just it's very exciting because yorgos is one of those signature filmmakers who has a point of view he has something to say and he also has a lot of style and verve to how he makes movies and i think reuniting with McNamara made a lot of sense given how the favorite went and you can definitely feel the DNA of that past collaboration in poor things. And I mean, yeah, you're not going to say no to working with Emma Stone. So it all makes sense. And yeah, I have to say, I like poor things a lot. This is a movie that is also a lot. It is not going to be for everyone. This is a movie that is very indulgent. It is long. It's about two hours, 20 minutes. It's also incredibly graphic, explicitly uh, nude and sexual and also gross at times but also very humorous there's a lot to it there's a lot going on it's not a movie for everyone ultimately i have some notes about the movie but overall i liked it and it's it's a movie that you i don't don't know how you can't appreciate what it's going for and what it's doing just because it's so unique and ultimately and there's a lot to this movie so i'm not really going to recap too much plot here there's just a lot of plot to this movie um let me know what you thought about poor things as you've seen it leave a comment below but yeah, um, I think the thing with Poor Things 
and most most broadly speaking, is it's basically like a gender flip Frankenstein story set in like a pseudo like Victorian England, but like this England has a steampunkish like bend to it. It's not totally reality or totally history, and you know we were very introduced quite quickly to this um, scientist character uh, Godwin or God played by Willem Dafoe, and he has kind of a uh, scarred, cut-up face that we learn learn about why in the movie. And he is a professor, but also just a tinkerer, a scientist, a uh, experimenter, a surgeon, all these types of things. And he has, and we learn this quite, quite quickly, he has basically taken a woman who he found had jumped off the bridge uh, in London, like I believe it was like Tower Bridge, and to commit suicide, ostensibly. And he takes the body, realizes that she's pregnant, and takes the brain of the dying you know, or dead uh, unborn child, puts it into the body of the woman who jumped, played by Emma Stone, and essentially reanimates new life into this old body. And as a result, you're introduced to Emma Stone, can't really speak, doesn't really have full motor skills, is basically a adolescent growing child in a adult body and uh godwin uh enlists the help of his best student played by rami youssef to study and document what's going on with bella which is the new name for emma stone's uh reanimated character and you know things i think like it's a really effective setup and visually the movie is really uh, stark, you know, has a kind of monochrome look in the beginning, and then we, we get expressed the color later on once the movie t- uh, moves forward. And uh, again, not to recap too much plot, but we get introduced to Mark Ruffalo's uh, character who becomes, uh, kind of takes an interest to Bella, and Bella also quickly becomes like all id. Like, this is a character that really wants to learn and explore things about life and one of those things she realizes is uh jumping on each other or the like however they phrase it eh, fucking and <laughs> she takes on basically ruffalo as a paramour and you know they uh they go to portugal then eventually they go on a boat across europe take a uh, pit stop in alexandria things go wrong uh they find themselves in paris before they get back to london and I think just the way where the movie goes and what happens with uh, Ruffalo's character, too, in the beginning, where Ruffalo's character is basically this kind of hammy guy who gets really uh, broken down into nothing by the end. Um, I think for me, there's like certain sequences in the movie that I enjoyed more than others. I thought the stuff with Portugal felt a little slow. It's like you kind of like got what was going on. I think we could have cut some of the scenes there, kind of kept it moving. You know, again, a little indulgent. But I think once we get to the boat, once we get to Paris, things start to really pick up. I think it's really enjoyable. Emma Stone is like really like on one in this movie, just in her bag. It's she's so charismatic, she's so compelling, and this in this character who never lacks in confidence, even if she at times lacks in knowledge of what's going on in the world and society. So much so that I think some of the funniest and compelling stuff in the movie is where she willingly, by choice, chooses to become a prostitute in Paris as almost like a form of like study to like learn about the sexual experience, having not had uh, many partners to that point, you know, apart from Ruffalo's character, and her learning how things go with Johns, and like all, and, and also conv- and, and very intentionally using it as a way to like make money for herself, um, all that stuff in, in the in the brothel is tremendous Catherine hunter plays like the head i think she's great in the movie um the stuff on the boat i really like especially once bella meets gerard carmichael's character who plays this kind of like openly like cynical nihilistic person um watching ruffalo kind of amount to nothing is awesome but even before that like the dancing scene on the boat i think was really good There's just so much like stand out like stark stuff in the movie and again it's so much so unique with i think it's a really sharp uh, script there's some, like a lot of physical comedy, like really early on, like when you watch like adolescent Bella pick up a cadaver's like penis and like drop it up and down. It's, like there's so many big laugh moments and like physical comedy. There's a lot of gross 
uh, comedy in the movie as well. And then it starts to get like really quite sexual. But again, I think it all kind of makes sense in terms of the mood and the POV of what the story is going for. And I think it really like takes off. The only th- other thing I didn't I, I, I didn't love as much in the movie is the the almost ending. Like I thought we could cut some of the Portugal stuff. And also, um, the movie seems to be wrapping up nicely where uh, Bella is going to marry uh, Rami Yusuf's character. And they had kind of agreed to do that, but Bella wanted to kind of go on an adventure first. And that's kind of like how the movie begins in earnest. But that gets interrupted when Emma Stone's original character who committed suicide that character's real life husband played by Christopher Abbott shows up to reclaim his wife basically at on the altar and then we kind of had this like 25 minute interlude with Christopher Abbott's character before the movie actually ends and I don't know like I think Abbott who's, who's a great actor I think Abbott's character was super one note as this kind of cruel um, not nice like military like general character like it, it was kind of one-dimensional to me all that stuff like obviously bella's gonna find a way to like break out of this prison and go back to what she wanted to do which was marry uh rami and like take over for godwin and like godwin had been sick and i think william defoe gets some really heartwarming stuff towards the end there after initially being positioned at the very beginning of the movie as a like pseudo villainous character for like his creation of bella and like his scientific pursuits and stuff but like it's all quite warm and i just feel like we almost like kind of wasted like 20 minutes at the end there all to amount to like yeah they put the goat brain in christopher abbott's character and they're all happily ever after it's like it it was kind of like interstitial that i don't think we needed so much doesn't take away from the movie or my appreciation the movie for all just kind of a note um yeah like ultimately i was really with the humor i was laughing a lot um I, i think the movie is very compelling very interesting and just very yorgos you know, and it's cer- certainly worthy of all the acclaim it's getting. It's going to be an awards contender. Um, it's not going to win Best Picture. We can write that off now. It's just too weird. You know, is Emma Stone going to win Best Actress? I'm not sure. It could happen. I would say I think adapted screenplay nominations definitely coming up. Of course, this is an adaptation of the Alistair Gray novel of the same name. So McNamara's definitely going to get some plots there, too. Um, people have talked about Ruffalo supporting actor nomination. It's a good performance. He kind of like makes fun of himself and goes on quite the journey as a character both good and bad but i wouldn't be shocked if he gets pushed out for somebody else to be honest but maybe but yeah i mean poor things there's so much plot like that like there's a lot to it but yeah i mean let me know what you thought of poor things i think it's definitely a movie that'll be polarizing i have lots of a range of opinions and a range of things that worked and didn't work for you but overall i just thought it was a pretty epic movie in the end and really carried by i think that core three the mcnamara script just the Yorgos POV and authorial intent and Emma Stone just as a force of nature again as an actor. Like those three like really carry us with poor things. So yeah, Banger movie. Uh, it's in my top 10 right now. Probably will stay there. But yeah, let me know what you thought of it. And for more movie reviews, more Oscar talk, subscribe and I'll see you next time. What's up? Welcome back to Nostalgia. Dave here with a review of Wonka starring Timothy Chalamet from Paul King, the director of the Paddington films. Wonka is back timothy chalamet back in our lives the movie is a hit it's probably going to be the biggest hit of the holiday season as well i think for good reason because wonka actually i think is pretty good and definitely exceeded my expectations i did not think highly of this movie or this the project of this movie going in you know going into the film i thought this was kind of a waste of timothy chalamet's time i've been a huge fan of timothy chalamet since 2017 Seeing how amazing he is in movies like Call Me By Your Name or Little Women, he is the preeminent actor of his generation right now. has been compared a lot to the career trajectories of people before him, such as Leonardo DiCaprio. He is a special talent. He is also having a great year because he's incredibly famous, dating Kylie Jenner right now, about to be the star of Dune once again early next year. Like Everything's turning up Timmy right now. And it turns out that's continuing with Wonka. But going in, I just didn't think like a kind of completely unasked for franchise reboot retelling film doing another Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie about young Wonka. I was like, really? Timothy Chalamet is going to do that? He's already got the franchise game going with Dune. I would have liked him to continue to do what he had been doing, which is working with auteurs, you know, working with Luke Guadagnino and Greta Gerwig and Adam McKay. Nonetheless... 
he does Wonka, and it's actually a pretty solid use of his talents. You know, Timmy, a song and dance man, but not an amazing singer. And Timmy singing in Wonka, I think is good enough. It's like it's passable, it's solid, you know. Um, he's not an amazing singer, he's not a broad he's not gonna sing on a musical on Broadway or anything. But he is a charismatic guy, he has a presence to him, and he still has like a precociousness to him. He has a youthful exuberance to him, despite being almost twenty eight at this point. And it's actually a pretty good fit for this version of Wonka. It's funny because the Willy Wonka we get in the film Wonka is very different from the Willy Wonka we've been introduced to in the past, which is a very almost demented and like dark character at times, right? From Gene Wilder, of course, most famously. And yeah, despite all that, I think he's kind of meet this movie on what it actually is, which is a Paul King movie. Paul King, if you've seen the Paddington films, he directed the first two. There's a third one on the way. Those Paddington films very much continue, uh, the vibes continue from that with Wonka. And what what is that? I mean, this is a great movie for kids, I think. It's a happy movie. It's a nice movie. It's, um, I think it's about, like, like belief and finding joy and things of that nature. It is, um, you know, not a movie that requires a lot of, uh, I think, in-depth uh, examination from, like, the critic uh, brain. That being said, the movie actually does present, like, a lot of, like, themes that it probably does it definitely doesn't have the means to tackle like there's a corrupt church involved in this there is a, a villainous a trio of chocolatiers called the chocolate cartel and their never-ending greed is pretty quite quickly criticized in the film in direct conflict to timothy chalamet's willy wonka who just kind of wants to bring his love of making uh confectionaries to the public and not uh price gouge them in the process you know you have that um you have orphans you have uh <laughs> I think there's like a lot of like disparate like adult themes tackled in in the movie that are just kind of there you know uh you have corruption you have the cartel bribing the chief of police with chocolate almost playing off his uh keegan michael key's character the police chief playing off key's uh addiction to the cartel's chocolate, playing that off as drug addiction, basically. Like, there's a lot of like subtext to Wonka that is just that. Like, there's nothing extra to it. You don't have to worry about it. You know, I like I said, I liked uh, uh, Timmy as Wonka, despite it feeling very much like a like a new version of the character entirely. Uh, there's some fun new songs. I think the Scrub Scrub song probably is the most earwormy of them all, which is what we get early on. There's a few choice moments where you hear a familiar Wonka song, Chocolate Factory song. Um, Hugh Grant as the Oompa Loompa. Underused, honestly. Hugh Grant's amazing uh, as the Oompa Loompa. It's like a bit of mocap work. Um, really funny, for sure. Um, I think if they make a sequel, and I think they will make a sequel, given how big a hit this movie has been, it's already over 100 million, 150, 150 million worldwide. After two weekends in abroad, one weekend domestic, gonna kill it through the holidays. They'll make a sequel, and when they do make a sequel, there will be more Hugh Grant, um, who famously had a big role in Paddington too. And you know, I liked um, I liked uh, Wonka's like crew uh, down at the hotel. Of course, quickly finding himself under uh, bad luck, uh, taken advantage of by Olivia Coleman's character. Mrs. Scrubbit and other people uh, in his, uh, you know, like him, uh, kind of fucked in, into an indentured servitude quickly. Again, there's some themes in the movie. You have Jim Carter, you have Natasha Rothwell, you have Rocky Thakrar. Like, I like all of them. I think they're all pretty nice in the movie, kind of playing off Timmy for the most part. You also have um, young Calla Lane, and I believe her first role as this orphan girl character, Noodle. And she's effectively the co-lead, or, or second lead of the movie and she just kind of has to like play off Willy Wonka and like kind of like dictate the themes around the movie and actually it works pretty good she has to be given some like emotional stuff at the end I think it's like effective as like emotional beats even if the movie kind of like quickly like ties things together like that ultimately I didn't mind I really like the chocolate cartel as well you have Patterson Joseph Matt Lucas famously from Great British Bake Off and other stuff, and Matthew uh, Banton. They play these three uh, very 
obviously nefarious, in cahoots, uh, chocolate businessmen who want to keep Willy Wonka's really good that they acknowledge chocolate off the market for their own sake. And I think their villainy is pretty fun. Matt Lucas, like, really obviously explaining their their evil deeds and stuff is good. All their, um, like, secret meetings with Kiko Michael Key's police chief character, I really enjoyed. Um, they have, a, like, a kind of like a showboat, like, show, show and dance scene where they have to convince Key to take their bribe and do what they want. And I think that was, like, really funny, like, really good, like, theater um, singing. And Key himself, I think, is pretty amusing as the corrupt police chief and like he starts putting on a fat suit and gets like ridiculously fat overall is it a bit fat phobic maybe i thought it was really funny stuff though because he's obviously being played for a laugh as this kind of like pathetic uh person who also is very corrupt so i I thought it was like really great um yeah like it's just kind of a nice movie it's fun it's definitely a musical and the marketing had really steered away from that but it's been interesting to think about that because historically audiences don't like musicals musicals are not box office bangers and we had a lot of musicals kind of flop lately like in the heights and dear evan hansen for example west side story as well remake but wonka by hiding the fact that it's actually a musical and waiting for all that good word of mouth and good audience reception not to mention good reviews now people don't care that it's a musical because people are telling them it's good it's kind of an interesting strategy that in the in the in the lead up to this, I was skeptical of because like, oh, they're hiding that it's a musical. They're hiding Timmy singing. It must be bad. But no, it actually seems to have worked out okay. So yeah, I mean Wonka. It's definitely a kids movie first, but it's just broadly enjoyable and like nice and makes you feel good. And it's hard to ask for more from something like this, especially something like this again that I didn't think had much of a reason to exist. People weren't clamoring for it, but. I'm really happy that I exceeded expectations. I think Chalamet is legitimately good in the movie, in the role. I think his best moments in the movie, I think the best overall like scene in the movie is probably this uh, protracted zoo set piece where uh, Willie and Noodle go to the zoo to milk a giraffe. And you find out why when you watch the movie. That's actually like really great. Some of the best singing. Like Timmy's good. And do I want him to do more interesting work? Yes. That being said, this will raise his profile even more. Now perhaps he will have the ability to uh, work with more, uh, you know, unpopular, you could say, auteurist directors and not have to worry about things too much because he's got the Dune bag. He's got the Wonka bag now, too. And then he can do the movies for him uh, moving forward. We'll see. But yeah, shout out Wonka. Exceed expectations. And I'm happy it's going to be a hit. WB definitely needs one at the box office after the tough year they've had with the DC films this year. Honestly, I think it's probably likely that Wonka will outgross Aquaman 2, speaking of DC movies, or WB movies, which is kind of hilarious to think about, but just speaks to the nadir that we are in with superhero movies right now. Nonetheless, let me know how you thought, uh, what you thought of Wonka, what you thought of Shaolin's performance, what you want from Timmy moving forward. And for more movie reviews, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. All right, that's going to do it for the pod this week. Next week, we got even more movies coming. It's just, it's it's our time right now, if you like movies. We got Aquaman The Lost Kingdom. We got Bradley Cooper's Maestro on Netflix. We got Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon on Netflix. We got the rom-com Anyone But You, starring Glenn Powell and Sidney Sweeney, with a lot of tabloid, behind-the-scenes stuff to that film. Of course, make sure you come back for my best movies of the year, best TV of the year as well coming soon subscribe youtube.com slash nostalgia pod linktree.com slash nostalgia pod see the links below leave a review let me know what's good and i'll see you next week yeah.